lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here alone again. Hopefully for the last time, well, maybe not the last time ever, but the last time for this particular thing. We do have plans of getting back together, which is good, because I'm, uh, I'm tired of doing this by myself. It's just not as much fun. Um, but we got to get some content out for you guys, so... Um, I'm here. I am. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks, and uh, not a lot has changed. Um, I did just kick my cats out of this room so that I could do this recording. They like this room this time of the morning because the sun comes in through the window and creates this nice, warm rectangle on the floor. It was a bit of a struggle, but I tricked them, and they'll just have to wait. Um, I'm not sure where to start really today. I think that we're going to get back to our roots. Uh, I say we when it's just me now, but it's still we as far as I'm concerned. Um, we started this podcast talking about Venezuela. Uh, it was one of the early articles I wrote on the blog in like the middle of 2018, um, was that, uh, I, I saw the writing on the wall that we were ramping up to, um, intervene in Venezuela in a in a more heavy-handed manner um, than we did uh, about eight or ten months after I wrote that article. And it looks like we're still doing it. Um, I don't know how much coverage it's getting, but there has been another coup attempt in Venezuela. Uh, it, the operation was led by two former special forces operators uh, from the U.S. Um, they were involved through a private security, uh, you know, Reed mercenary uh, firm called Silver Corps USA. And, of course, the, the U.S. government denies any involvement in this, uh, and there has surfaced, a, I believe it was a $120 million contract uh, between this company and Juan Guaido, which is the U.S. anointed leader of Venezuela, and uh, and Guaido denies that this contract is real. But well, uh, let's back up a little bit. I guess um, there was a major deployment of U.S. military force to the Caribbean and Eastern Pacific just a couple of weeks before. Uh, ostensibly to handle drug trafficking issues, um, focused on Colombia. Of course, Colombia is an ally of the U.S., and uh, they are the major source of um, a a lot of these illicit drugs. Uh, Also, it should probably be noted that the United States is the single largest consumer of these illicit drugs, too. But at any rate... Um, Some questions were raised at the time by Venezuela about the U.S.'s real motives, and by Cuba as well. Um, And uh, then, just a few weeks later, um, there's this uh, coup attempt. It it failed pretty miserably. Um, But anyway, uh, you know, it just raises some questions. We may or may not have been involved. I'm sure we were to some degree, because... um, if you follow the money, let's assume that this $120 million contract is, is real. Because uh, while Guaido denies um, that the contract is real, uh, these are mercenaries. Um, the, you know, they, they didn't just decide on their own to do this because they believe in Guaido or hate Maduro. Uh, I, I doubt. Uh, these Special Forces guys were in the Middle East, not in South America, so... Although, um, at least primarily. Um, so it's hard to imagine that they were ideologically or like really involved in this. Uh, someone paid them, I think it's fair to say. And uh, we have this contract with Guaido's name on it. Um, but even if uh, Guaido is the person who actually hired them, um, where did that $120 million come from? And um, the the answer is actually pretty simple. Uh, the U.S. gave it to him. Uh, not in this case, I don't think, taxpayer money, although that certainly is probably part of the funding that he's gotten. Um, I, I know that in the article that I wrote a couple of years ago, I was talking about uh, 
State Department funds um, primarily that were being diverted into Venezuela for opposition groups. And the State Department is, of course, funded by taxpayer money, but primarily this money would be um, Venezuelan state funds that were frozen by the U.S. Um, and then given to uh, the the person who the U.S. decided was going to be the new leader of Venezuela, in this case, Guaido. I, there's not a whole lot more to say about that right now. Um, it's kind of uh, amazing that we're still involved in this, is what I would say, because I, I don't really have any doubt that that the U.S. was um, a major player. And I, I think that there was, you know, while this was clearly p- pretty poor planning, um, the idea was that this, uh, you know, plausibly deniable coup, um, if successful, would be easily backed up by the new deployment of military forces in, to the Caribbean um, and Eastern Pacific. So it didn't work out and ends up, um, being a kind of a wasted deployment, but here we are again. And uh, sp- speaking of the Navy, they're certainly this seems like a reasonable transition. Um, they're certainly uh, struggling with uh, with coronavirus outbreaks, which is no surprise. Um, I have been saying uh, at least a few times that I think that the the major issue that seems to be um, fueling the spread of the virus is uh, population density, and certainly a ship is pretty population dense. And uh, but I, I guess we're gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and shift to the um, coronavirus coverage. Hey, you got like five minutes of something else. That's a lot these days. Um, this it'll end up being like twenty percent of the podcast. So. Uh, was foreign policy instead of coronavirus, so, you know, woohoo. But uh, I, I guess, actually, where I want to start with this is um, that there's so much criticism of the administration, and while I'm n- not a particular fan of Trump or actually any administration when it comes right down to it, I uh, I can't think of a president that I've really liked um, in my lifetime, uh, but Anyway, this is a no-win for Trump or Clinton or anybody else that it could have been in that office at this time. <clears throat> uh, I'll keep saying that um, the government can't protect you from something like this. Uh, a virus is is uh, not is not a threat that the government can defend you against. Just a moment. I'm gonna get a drink of water. See, this is another one of those moments where it's nice to have a co-host so he can fill in the space while I drink my water. And Anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my allergies have been terrible through this, and it was supposed to rain the other day and it didn't, so all that pollen is still in the air. It's terrible. Where was I? Okay. Um, you know, the uh, the idea that the government can do something to defend you against a virus is just kind of absurd on the face of it. Um, but this is what has to happen. Um, the, the powers that be need to keep you believing that if only government had acted appropriately, we wouldn't be in this mess. Um, and it's just not true, but it leaves the impression that you still need the government to help you in, in cases like this. And, the you know, a good government would have managed this crisis and we wouldn't have this crisis. Um, but because, uh, uh, you know, it's it's gotten, we'll say, quote, unquote, bad, um, that it is uh, the fault of the government failing to act in the, in the right manner. It's just not true. It wouldn't have mattered who was in there. It wouldn't matter what they were doing. Um, it's... I would say the statistics bear out that all these activities aren't actually having that much of an impact, and we'll get to that later. <clears throat> um, I mean, 
just take as an example, um, Nancy Pelosi uh, criticism. Oh, okay, so you have to make Trump look bad. So um, very early on, he closed uh, borders with China, right? Uh, very soon after this outbreak. And he was criticized at the time for that, for being a racist. Um, now it seems that that might not have been such a terrible idea. So Nancy Pelosi's asked about this and she criticizes Trump. She says, well, he didn't really close the border. Um, the criticism now is that he let, uh, Americans come home from China. Now just think for a moment, um, what they would have said about Trump if he had not permitted Americans to come home from China at the time. So this is just a like a really obvious example, I think, of this being a no-win for him. Um, if he doesn't shut the borders, uh, then he's criticized for not shutting the borders. If he does shut the borders, he's criticized for shutting the borders. Um, he didn't shut the borders enough because he let the Americans come home. But imagine if he had not let the Americans come home. I, there's just there's just no way to win this. And so here we are back in this situation now. <clears throat> excuse me, um, where no matter what, uh, we have destroyed our economy, and at some point, we're right back where we started, where if we would be in the same situation if we hadn't shut down our economy. And uh, I, I guess we're there. I mean, they're starting to open up all over the place, but the... Um, okay, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um I guess the point is that where what what is the other plan? Um, they originally sold us on the idea that we needed to uh, stay home and lock down um, to flatten the curve because otherwise the healthcare system would be overwhelmed, and so we needed to flatten the curve so that the healthcare system wouldn't be overwhelmed by the number of cases all at once. Well, now they've pulled this little bait and switch where the idea is that we have to stay locked down until they've defeated the virus, which, of course, will never happen. Um, but I, I'm not sure where along the way it switched from flatten the curve to until we're all safe again. But this is obviously a pipe dream. And uh, at some point, I mean, unless they, I guess they, there are some people that actually are advocating that we stay locked down until they develop a, a vaccine in what 18, 24 months. You want to shut everything down for almost two years for this. At some point you have to open back up because you know, the, the costs of staying closed become much greater than the costs of, um, of the infection. And I guess we're there now, but at whatever point you open up, what have you really accomplished? Um, how would it have been different if we had just stayed open in the first place and let people make their own choices about what they were willing to risk? And I think the answer is that there is there isn't really any difference. Um, the uh, United Kingdom, um, their I guess it was their central bank or. Uh, their finance ministry or whatever. Anyway, um, they predicted last week that their economy will shrink 14% in 2020 uh, due to COVID-19. And I would say that no, um, it's not shrinking by 14% due to COVID-19. It's shrinking by 14% due to the government's reaction to COVID-19 and shutting everything down. Um, the The government choices are responsible, not the disease. And I think the same is true here in the U.S. Um, it certainly seems to... I, I I don't dispute that there are people that are at great risk because of this. Um, but those people know who they are, and they can choose to lock themselves down. And I hope that people that, um, that try and separate themselves as much as they can um, if they from the people in their lives that they know are also at risk. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to skip it today. Today's Mother's Day. I haven't seen my mom in a few months. She only lives uh, a couple of miles from me, um, and uh, there's there's no avoiding it today. I've been trying. You know, my parents are in their 70s, so I've I've been I've been avoiding them, frankly. Um, 
you know, talking, but not, uh, not physically interacting. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I think that there's uh, not taking no for an answer today for lunch, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll be as safe as I can during that time. Um, and I, I think that people are perfectly reasonable and responsible if given the information. Um, and I've talked before about that. I, I think part of the problem is that we've gotten so used to government and major media lying to us that it's hard to take anything that they say at face value. So there's lots of questions. And of course, they're presenting um, and have been presenting all of this information that they've been giving as fact, when the truth is we don't really know yet, and we won't for some time. There's not been any kind of scientific study on any of this, or at least nothing that's been um, uh, you know, peer-reviewed and replicated and so forth. Uh, take, for example, the, the vaccine issues. Uh, so um, Trump was... Uh, was promoting hydro, hydro, hydroxychloroquine. Is that right? Hydroxychloroquine. Sounds right. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I knew those batteries would run out eventually, and they did. I'm not entirely sure where it cut off, so I'm just going to start over with the vaccine stuff. Because it had to have been somewhere around in there. Um so, take, for example, the, the vaccine issues. Uh, in the beginning, uh, Trump was promoting hydroxychloroquine and, uh, I guess, hydroxychloroquine with zinc. At any rate, um, it seems like, to me, that if you are, um, if you have a drug that shows some promise... And clearly it does, because doctors are prescribing it. Doctors are continuing to prescribe it um, in in these cases. And it seems, at least in some people's opinion, to have an impact. It seems like you would be excited about this. Like, okay, we have something. It's cheap and available. And, uh, and it seems to have uh, some positive impact. Great, we have a starting point. But that's not how it was treated at all. Um, it, instead, it was, well, this hasn't been peer-reviewed. Uh, the FDA hasn't approved it. By the way, the FDA still hasn't approved it for off-label use, even though doctors are, are using it. Um, but, you know, the, the reaction was, was very strange to something that, that seemed to at least initially show some promises. Um, now, uh, Fauci has uh, announced this new... Um, drug remdesivir. I might be pronouncing that one wrong too. <clears throat> but uh, remdesivir, and um, and it's like a godsend according to the media. But it's in the same situation. It hasn't had studies peer reviewed. There hasn't been time. Nobody's gotten the real data on this. I I don't know that it's that it's any better. But one thing, uh, you know, maybe it is. And if it is, that's great. But the difference in how these things were have been handled, how these various uh, pharmaceutical suggestions have been handled, is is quite strange. I think, um, and I think that there is a uh, an, an economic motivation for it. Um, look into Fauci a little bit. He has patents on all kinds of uh, uh, vaccine delivery systems and so forth. The, he stands to make quite a bit of money. Um, if we can come up with something new and, uh, and the whole actually, um, system of drug approvals is, is so corrupt in this country anyway, but the, I guess what I want to do, I suppose, is just point out the difference here. Um, I, hydroxychloroquine, uh, may or may not work, but it has shown some promise, um, neither hydroxychloroquine nor remdesivir have peer reviewed studies or replicated studies at this point. Um, but as soon as remdesivir was announced, uh, essentially they cut off funding for any studies with hydroxychloroquine and zinc. And, um, the remdesivir doesn't have any prophylactic, uh, value as far as I have heard. Uh, but the hydroxychloroquine and zinc did, um, at least show some, uh, you know, possibility that it was effective as a prophylactic treatment as well. Um, but here's the the big difference, 
and and this is where you know where vaccines come in as well. Um, hydroxychloroquine and zinc treating uh, coronavirus costs like tens of cents a day, and remdesivir um, treating the virus costs hundreds of dollars a day. Now, what's the pharmaceutical industry going to prefer? The generic, widely available, cheap drug, old drug, or the new, expensive, you know, and um, exclusive patented drug? I think it's a question worth asking. And, uh... You know, as for me, if I, a couple of things, you know, let me go ahead and get this on record. Um, if I contract the virus and I end up in the hospital, I do not want to be put on a ventilator under any circumstances. Treat me with hydroxychloroquine and zinc and high flow oxygen and we'll just, we'll see how it, it turns out. Um, it seems uh, from the studies that I've seen that being put on a respirator is essentially a death sentence. So do not, period, ever put me on a respirator. Um, but that's that's beside the point. I, I do want to point out here, um, just kind of shifting into some statistics, in, in relation to the economy shrinking by a tremendous amount, um, you know, I, I keep seeing headlines about uh, the number of unemployment claims in the U.S., um, that it jumped from like around 4% to around 20% in a month. <clears throat> uh, that's, uh, you know, that's just a tremendous jump. And I think there's somewhere around 30 million unemployment claims uh, at this point, maybe 35. Just bear in mind that in the entire 2008 financial crisis, there were only about 15 million unemployment claims filed. So we've got twice the unemployment in a month and a half um, as in the entire year and a half uh, after the 2008 collapse. And I think that this is a far more serious concern, um, especially when you start breaking it down. And the they keep pressing in the media that the U.S. is the hardest hit country. And they're doing this based on raw numbers. But you got to remember how big this country is. Um, so the easiest thing to do is to break it down into uh, into per um, hundred thousand. Th this is generally the you know you can sh shrink or um, expand the numbers by changing the reference point. But in infections per hundred thousand. Um, just to get some perspective on this, uh, the U.S. has about 365 infections per 100,000. Um, France, who locked down really early, um, has about 250. Uh, you know, Spain, who is terribly hit, is uh, 530. Um, the U.K. is at about 300. Um, and then I, I threw in uh, these Scandinavian countries just because it, it may be of interest. Um, the Norway has about 150 infections per 100,000, and their next-door neighbor, Sweden, that did almost nothing, um, has about 235. <clears throat> now, so the U.S. is... I mean, there's actually not a really significant statistical difference between these numbers. I mean, 365 sounds like a lot compared to 250 in France um, and sounds like a little compared to 530 in Spain. But the on a per 100,000 um, basis, this is not a big difference. Um, you know, if you break it down more, you're looking at uh, 3.65 versus 2.5. Um, or 5.3. The these numbers are not st st statistically um, significantly different from each other. Um, and then if you look at deaths per hundred thousand, which is probably the thing that we ought to be concerned about, uh, because people get sick. Um, that's that's just a you know, it, it's inevitable, right? But no, no matter what your government may tell you. But if you look at deaths per hundred thousand. Um, in the U.S., uh, we have about 21 deaths per 100,000 population, not per 100,000 cases. Um, 
21 deaths per 100,000 population. Uh, in France, which, like I said, locked down really early, um, the number's 38. Uh, 45 in the UK, 54 in Spain, um, Norway at 4, and Sweden at 29. At that point, I actually checked out Finland as well, uh, because there's been some discussion about these Scandinavian countries because they've handled the, the crisis very differently. Um, so uh, n- uh, Norway and Finland um, locked down like most other of the EU nations and and other, uh, you know, Western style nations around the world. Um, Sweden did not, um, they, uh, recommended, um, you know, personal protection and, uh, social distancing and so forth, but they let people go about their lives as they chose. <clears throat> now the, um, deaths per hundred thousand in, in Sweden aren't, um, st- statistically higher, uh, than, and if, or, or lower. They're about statistically the same as the uh, U.S., France, um, etc. But Norway and Finland were both clocking in at about four deaths per 100,000. I think the thing to do is to check out what they're doing um, because their, uh, their infections weren't sig- uh, significantly different per 100,000, but their deaths are way down. So why is that? Um, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying this is something that seems like it would merit some um, additional investigation, which I didn't have time to do. Sorry. Um, and then, you know, also for perspective, um, I-, I looked up other major causes of uh, mortality in the U.S. Um, this is also on a per hundred thousand basis. Um, in the U.S., uh, heart disease, uh, This these numbers are from 2018, um, by the way, Um Heart disease killed about 165 people per 100,000. Uh, cancer killed 150. Accidental injuries were another 50 um, people per 100,000, which is more than twice the current um, death uh, mortality per 100,000 for COVID. Um, Alzheimer's uh, killed 31 per 100,000. Um, diabetes is clocking in at about the same rate as uh, COVID with 21 deaths per 100,000. Um and then, and there were a few others that were more, you know, strokes and, and things like that as well. Um, but I, I just picked a few of these. Uh, you know, there are 14 suicides per 100,000 um, people in the U.S. 21 deaths by COVID per 100,000. 14 by suicide per 100,000. One of these things I feel like is more controllable than the other. Um I'll let you guess which one. But anyway, I think that this is an important thing to to look at when we're destroying our economy um, for this. And I just want people to understand that the, the threat for the average citizen isn't really that significant. Um, that there are much greater threats out there. And especially when they have uh, completely devoted some healthcare systems in the U.S. to fighting COVID and have decided to ignore some of the other things that cause a lot more deaths on that list that I just read. Um, There are people that are missing cancer treatments. There are people that are, you know, there's a a lot of things that aren't being done because the resources have been completely devoted to COVID-19. And some of the things that aren't being done have impacts on the mortality rates of problems and health problems that already have statistically much, much higher mortality rates than COVID does. I mean, think of, during this time period, we've had both um, the St. Patrick's Day and um, Cinco de Mayo uh, during the shutdown. Think about those those Irish pubs and bars and those uh, Mexican um, cantinas y cucinas. Like, there has been a lot, a lot lost. Um, I was talking with Liberty Larry earlier in the week, and um, he reminded me it, you know, that one of our uh, friends that works at a Mexican place, um, that's worked at Mexican places for years, uh, talked about how during um, Cinco de Mayo, they bring in all kinds of temporary help, like a ton of temporary help around uh, Cinco de Mayo. But all those places were closed, and all those people lost out on those job opportunities because of this. Again, um, I, I say that the the cause of the economic shrinking, um, the, the economic problems that come forward, they aren't 
because of COVID-19. Be, they're because of our government that has forced these shutdowns. Not to say that there wouldn't have been some economic fallout from COVID. There certainly would have been. But it would have been much, much smaller if people were permitted to make their own choices. And there's not really evidence at this point to suggest that the impact of COVID would have been much, much higher if people had been permitted to make their own choices. <clears throat> I suppose that's all I've got. Um, uh, I, I don't think that we're going to get another podcast out for a couple of weeks, but when we get one out in a couple of weeks, uh, it should be with both of us again. So looking forward to that. Um, in the meantime, um, happy Mother's Day. Uh, to everyone, uh, particularly uh, my mom um, and Jacqueline and uh, my cousins, Carrie and Katie, uh, Larissa, Leslie, Beth, Jerry, Tara, Stephanie, Rebecca, Jenny, Joanne, and everybody else that I can't think of right at this moment. Um, Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Uh, You guys enjoy yourselves. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.